Okay, well, welcome to the Prophecy Seminar here at Currabee Christian Church. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to um, present biblical prophecy uh, today. And, um, you know, I've been saddened over the years, the last many, many years, with how prophecy in the Christian church has just been a forgotten and neglected subject because it's such a fantastic, encouraging subject as we're going to find out in our five sessions that we're going to do. You know, a third of the Bible is related to future prophecy, biblical prophecy, a third of the Bible. So there you go. It must be important. I'd like to just um, open in prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to open your word, and it's your word, Lord. And may you just uh, teach us today. May you open our eyes to the truth of your word, and especially you, Lord Jesus, that you will be uplifted, that you will be glorified, that you will be honoured. And so we just thank you for this opportunity, and we commit it to you, and may you guide and lead by your spirit and teach our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go to there, first of all. So in this first session, I'd like to, um, to lay a foundation. And um, you'll see there up on the screen, I'd like to lay a foundation on the um, importance of biblical prophecy. We need to get a foundation first if we're going to look at this very important subject. The foundation will help us answer the question concerning um, what we're going to be covering in these next, the, ne the four following sessions on biblical prophecy. So, there are two ways that prophetic truth are, was conveyed in Bible times. The first one is forth telling. Now, what's forth telling? Forth telling the word of God, whereby a prophet would speak a prophetic message to the people of that time for a present situation, just like in the Old Testament prophets, for that time. And then there was foretelling the word of God, whereby a prophet would speak a prophetic message to the people of that time, but it was bringing out future, a future situation or event. So there's many occasions in the prophetic books of the Old Testament that the prophet would be saying things that a message both for the hearers of that time, we need to understand this, it was for the hearers of that time, but also a prophetic message for a future time, person or event. Now, very important that we understand this little principle here. Since the Holy Spirit is the author of the word of God, he has total freedom to convey truth how he likes. Is that not correct? He's the author, okay? Now, I want to give a little example uh, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and in verses 16 to 21. We're not going to read all those verses. But Peter gives a, uh, a message here after, just after following um, Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he quotes this prophecy from Joel chapter 2. Now, what I want to bring out here is that what he quotes, he quotes Joel nearly word by word. But there's certain things that didn't happen, according to Joel's prophecy, that he quotes here in Acts chapter 2. Because what he was doing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he was just showing forth what had just taken place at Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit and people being saved. He uses those verses. So basically he was using uh, verse 17 and, in, and it shall come about in the last days that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. The pouring forth of his spirit he was using, the Holy Spirit was using to show that he did that on the day of Pentecost when, when the church was first formed. And then in verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But there's certain aspects in that prophecy that didn't happen. You know, the sky, the, the, the sun wasn't darkened, the, the moon didn't turn into blood and all that. That's to do with the second coming of Christ. See? So there's a, there's a dual, there's a dual um, prophetic message there that we need to understand. And this is how the Holy Spirit brings out prophetic truth. There can be some of it used for that time and other is future 
for the future. And that's where we need to handle actively the word of truth as we look into it. So I'd like to look at the foretelling aspect in these next five sessions, the foretelling aspect of prophecy. God is the only one who knows the future. He's the eternal God and he lives outside of time. He knows the future. And he only know, he's the only one who knows what's going to happen. And you know what? Not just that. He doesn't just know that. He has actually planned it all out from start to finish. Now, don't just believe me. Let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11. I don't want you to listen to me in these five sessions. I want to point you to the Word of God, and you need to just see what the Word of God says. What I say doesn't matter. What God says does matter. Okay? And so in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. And Paul says this. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think I should be able to go to that there. Sorry, I didn't push that forward. I might need reminding to push it forward. <laughs> so this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus, God, has an eternal purpose. We need to understand that an eternal purpose. And we have it in the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, from creation to the new heavens and the new earth. From Genesis to Revelation, we have God's story of the whole Bible. It's all written there. It's all here in this book that we call the Bible. We just need to get in and look and study and compare and compare to get the big picture. That there is what I call the big picture. That's the big picture from creation to the new heavens and new earth according to the word of God, just as you take it chronologically through the Bible. That, that's what that picture there represents. Okay. So, all prophecy testifies a time or an event that centres on the person of Jesus Christ. This is what we need to really understand here. When we look at Bible prophecy, it's not just about the future. Bible prophecy is all about Jesus Christ. This is the big point. It's all about Jesus Christ. It centers on Jesus Christ. This can best be understood from a statement made by the Apostle John in the last part of Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And this is what the Apostle John says. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Wow. It testifies Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's uplifting Jesus, you see. That's what it's all about. That's what prophecy is all about. It's not just, oh, let's see what end time events are. It's, you know, it's about Jesus and him and what he's going to do. That's what it's about. So all biblical prophecy is written to uplift Jesus as saviour, lord, and king. That's what it's for. We, that, that, if, we, if, we, if I don't say anything else, that is the most important thing we need to understand. <laughs> We're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ here, the one who came and paid for our sin on that cross and the plan and purpose that he has. He has an eternal plan and purpose. Okay? And this is why we, it's important. So it gives all, it uplifts Jesus so that he, along with God the Father, can be given all the honour, all the praise, and all the glory. Amen? Amen. This can be clearly seen through God's chosen earthly people, Israel, and God's chosen heavenly people, the church. See, there's two, two people groups. In the Old Testament, there was Israel. Now, in this age, there's the church. God's chosen earthly people, Israel. God's chosen heavenly people, us, the church. There's two people groups there, two different people groups. But it's all about Jesus. How do we know that? Well, the Jews are looking for their Messiah. They're still looking for the Messiah, aren't they, the Jews? Who is to come and set up his earthly kingdom and to make them the head nation, to rule all the nations with him in an everlasting kingdom. Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah and that Israel was hoping for. Even though to this day, unfortunately, Israel still, the Jews today, 2020 
are rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They don't accept the New Testament. They don't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Today, right up to until today. And then there's the church. The church is looking for the for we're looking for our Lord and Savior to return, aren't we? We're looking for the blessed hope. That's what we're looking for, the blessed hope, the return of Jesus Christ, to take all believers to be with him forevermore. And that's found in Titus 2:13. And Jesus Christ is the one who will come back in the air and we will be caught up to meet him in the air. And that's what we're going to be covering tonight in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Does the Bible teach the rapture of the church? That's what we're going to be looking into. Now, to downplay the relevance and importance of prophetic truth in Scripture is to downplay or belittle the glory and honour that alone belongs to Jesus Christ. That's what I see. And that's why it disappoints me that prophecy has been, has been just put out of the picture in the, in the Christian church many, for many years now. It's not seen as important. Well, I see it as important because it's downplaying, it's belittling our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not giving him his rightful place. That's what's important here, giving Jesus his rightful place, his proper place, as revealed in the scriptures. So no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. It is important for any student of the Bible to understand that it, we can't just make up our own interpretations. None of us. We can't just make, make up an interpretation of what uh, some prophecy means. We can't do that. The Apostle B Peter made this very clear in his second letter to the churches in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. And this is what Peter said. So we have the prophetic word made more sure. And by the way, in the previous verses before that was talking about the, the, um, when Jesus, uh, the transfiguration, when Jesus revealed himself in glory to, to, to Peter and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. To which you do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So whether it was um, uh, Ezekiel, whether it was Daniel, whether it was John, whoever it was, there were men who were moved by the Spirit of God. It wasn't their interpretation. It was God working through them. So in verse 19 of this verse, okay, I got that? Yeah. And I can't see that. Okay. I think that's where we're up to. I've got to remember to push this. <laughs> you might have to. <laughs> I get carried away. Sorry about that. In verse 19, we are told that we do well to pay attention to the prophetic word. That's what Peter says, the Apostle Peter. We do well to pay attention to it. Not, not ignore it, not neglect it, neglect it like most of the church has been doing in the, in the last decades. Not to neglect it. Pay attention to it. That's what my Bible says. We need to pay attention to it. So... This tells me that Christians are not to ignore or treat lightly the prophetic word given to us in the Bible. Rather, we are to study his word and allow the spirit of God to teach and encourage us through the many prophetic truths. Can you see what I'm doing here? I'm laying a foundation. I'm laying a very important foundation as to the prophecies given to us in the Bible. In, second, in, in, in verse 20... Peter goes on to say, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No one can give his own interpretation to any biblical prophecy. And Peter gives us the reason in verse 21. This is the reason. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but rather it was given by men, moved by the Holy Spirit, who spoke from God, as the verse says. So no biblical prophecy came from the man alone. No biblical prophecy. Whether it was Isaiah or Daniel in the Old Testament or Peter, or Peter and John in the New Testament, 
Rather, the prophecies came from the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired and empowered the different men to speak or write down the given prophecy. And we're told that in, in 2 Timothy, aren't we? Chapter 3, verse 16. There's a verse you can look up later. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Talks about that, that the word of God is inspired by this God breathed. So, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handing the word of truth. That's going to be the next picture, so I'll just leave that up. That's not to scare you, by the way. Let's have a look at principles of interpretation then. This is where we get, this is important. There are principles of interpretation in how we are to handle this word, the Bible. There's principles, very clear principles. The first one is comparing scripture with scripture. Before we make any conclusions regarding any biblical prophecies recorded in God's word, we must compare scripture with scripture. No portion of scripture stands alone. Did I um, have that up there? No, I mustn't have written any of that down. Anyway, that's okay. So it, no prophecy of scripture stands alone. And in the case of prophecy, it takes many prophecies linked together to give God's prophetic big picture. That's what we need, see? We need the prophetic big picture. How do all the different prophecies that are mentioned, that are scattered everywhere through the word of God, we need to put it together in a big picture. That's what we need to do. That's why we have to accurately handle the word of truth. And that's why we have to in compare scripture with scripture. So we don't go outside the Bible to get an interpretation. We get an interpretation from in the Bible, from within the Bible. <laughs> that's what we do. Very important principle. In, um, it takes many prophecies linked together to form God's prophetic big, pit, big picture, which is his eternal plan and purpose for the ages, like we saw back in our uh, first picture. The writer to the Hebrews said it this way in chapter 1 and verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Notice that, many portions. We need to put the many portions, this is how God put together the Bible, we need to put all those many portions of God's prophecies together to complete the big picture. That's why we need to be students of the Bible. That's why we can't just casually handle the Bible, just casually read it, we need to study it. It takes time, it takes effort. It's a big book, isn't it? <laughs> It is a big book and it takes diligence to do that, just like Paul says we need to be. The basic thrust to this principle of interpretation is let the Bible interpret the Bible. And in so doing, we will have less chance of creating our own interpretations. All of us have to be wary of our own interpretations. Okay? So... I'm going to give an example now, a good example of how to, this comparing scripture with scripture and how important it is. I want to use, uh, in, if you turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, I want to use the, um, the one about the great red dragon, the woman and a child in Revelation chapter 12. And... Um, I might just quickly read that passage in Revelation chapter 12. And this is in a context. Revelation chapter 12 was actually in the middle, in the middle of the tribulation, which is from chapter 6 through to 19 of the book of Revelation. It just gives us all the details of it. That's what Revelation is all about. It gives us the details. And this is in the middle of the week. So it says here, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child and she cried out being in labour in pain to give birth. Then another sign, a second sign appeared in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his heads were ten, ten, seven diadems or, grand, or crowns. 
and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And that's actually going back. That's actually going back in history. That's actually going back when Satan, when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven and became Satan. And a third of the, um, the angels rebelled with Satan, with Lucifer. And they became the demons. And that's how we have the demons today. So that's actually referring back to give a picture, you see. Anyway, we won't get into that at the moment. And the dragon stood before the woman and was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, and who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. So there she was nourished, would be nourished for 1,260 days. Okay, I'll just stop reading there. We'll go to the um, next thing. The symbolism of the great red dra of the great red dragon. Well, I don't know if you've heard any. Have you heard any interpretations of the great red dragon? Like I could stand here now and say, oh, I think the great red dragon is the is is the nation America, you know, and the seven heads that represents this and that, and it's to do with America in end time prophecy. So I could give my own interpretation. And you could be there, oh, wow, wow. Did you hear what that guy said? Oh, and there's America in prophecy. Oh, let's get excited about it. We don't do that. Okay, I'm going to show, this is what we need to do. The symbolism of the great red dragon mentioned here in verse 3 is an easy one to safely interpret. Notice I said symbolism. This, that picture of that great red dragon, it's symbolism. It's symbolic. But it has a literal meaning. <laughs> Okay, this is the thing. It has a literal meaning. Because in verse 9 of the same chapter, we are clearly told who the dragon is. If you look at verse 9, and the great red dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So is the great red dragon America? No, it's not. What does the Bible say? What does comparing the Bible with the Bible say? The great red dragon is symbolic of the devil. The literal devil, Satan, a very literal spiritual being that the Bible talks about many times. Now, the child or son is relatively easy to interpret too because of the description given to describe him in the surrounding verses. In verse 5, you'll notice one of the verses we read. In verse 5, we are told that the male child will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Ah, oh. hmm. Who in the Bible is described as ruling the nations with a rod of iron? Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Now, we only need to turn to other passages of this same book, the book of Revelation, to get the answer, such as Revelation 2.27. You can look that up if you like. Revelation 19.15, it talks about that. Chapter 19, verse 15 is, the, is in the context of Christ's second coming. So we know that the description of ruling with a rod of iron belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we let the Bible interpret the Bible. We look in the Bible for the clues. We look in the Bible for the answer to the clues. So we are also told in 12.5, in chapter 12, verse 5, that the child will be caught up to God and his throne. Oh, what does that describe? What, ha what happened to Jesus? Jesus left this planet. Okay, the, when he... The ascension, he went back into heaven. We know that. The Bible says that. Okay? So we, that's a pretty easy one to interpret too. But what about the woman mentioned in verse 1? I wonder who she could be. This is where we need to search for clues. Not only in this chapter, chapter 12 of Revelation, or not even in the rest of the book of Revelation, or not even in the whole New Testament. We, we, we've got a whole Bible. We've got to church the whole Bible for clues. The first clue given in 12.5 is that the male child whom we know is Christ comes from this woman. So that's the first clue given. The male child comes from this woman. And we know the male child is Jesus. This would mean that the woman needs to be connected in some way to the birth of Christ. Correct? If this was the only description given of the woman, we might surmise that the woman could be Mary. Oh, well, maybe the woman's Mary. Yet there, are, there is another description of the woman in verse 1, which says that the woman was clothed with the sun. 
What's the next one? Yes, we do. The woman was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, what does this mean? See, more symbolism. But there's a literal meaning. That's what we've got to look for, the literal meaning of the symbolism. This is a very important clue, yet we won't find the answer here in the book of Revelation or even in the rest of the New Testament. So we've got to be like a good student of the Bible and go looking back. So what do we do? Well, we look at where is there a mention of these things? And we go back to Genesis 37. And in Genesis 37, verses 1 to 11, we, it's Joseph's had two dreams. You know about the two dreams that Joseph had, okay? And after relating his first dream to his brothers, the brothers interpreted clearly in verse 8. So in Genesis 37 and verse 8, they interpret the, the dream. Are you actually going to reign over us? They gave the interpretation. They knew what, they knew what Joseph was, um, was saying in that dream. Then in the second dream in verse 9, Joseph said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars. Oh, back in Revelation, except it's 12 stars, but he is the 12th star, <laughs> so he didn't include himself, the 11 or his 11 brothers, okay? The sun and the moon and the 11 stars, he didn't say 12 stars because he didn't bow down to himself, were bowing down to me. There's the 12th star. We are also given the interpretation of who the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were from this dream with what Jacob said in verse 10. Look what Jacob says in verse 10. Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? No. Still on that. Okay. Jacob was saying that he was the sun. Rachel was the moon. And Joseph's 11 brothers were the 11 stars. Is that not the correct? Is that what not Genesis says there? Is not that the interpretation of Genesis? So this prophetic dream was fulfilled when Joseph became the second ruler of Egypt and his family came to Egypt in a time of great famine and they bowed down to him. You know the story yet not knowing that it was him at first. And that's in Genesis 42, 6 and 43, 26 and 44, 14. Now the Apostle John, nearly 2,000 years later, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses this biblical symbolism to describe the woman here in Revelation, chapter 12. Can you see that? Using the same interpretation given in Genesis 37, we can safely conclude that the woman of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, verse 2, verses 4 to 6, and verses 13 to 16 is referring to the nation of Israel. Remember Jacob? Jacob's name was what? Changed to Israel. We know that. See, Israel. And he had, 12, he had his wives and he had 12 sons, correct? And they became the 12 tribes of Israel, which is the nation of Israel. So the woman is the nation of Israel. So this, this, this doesn't have to be so mysterious, this chapter 12 of Revelation. This symbolism here has a literal meaning. It's talking about Satan, the very real and literal Satan. It's talking about a very real and literal Jesus Christ. And it's talking about a very real and literal nation Israel. <laughs> but it's just in symbolism. I get excited when I see things like this, that the word of God has the interpretation there for us if we're willing to search it out. So the interpretation makes sense of the whole chapter along with the prophetic message of the whole book in Revelation here because it's, the Revelation is all about the last days, what's going to happen just prior to Jesus coming back and the tribulation, that awful tribulation time and how Israel will be having to go through that purging time of the tribulation before they actually accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Messiah at the second coming. And we're going to look at that later you know, as we look into the prophecies. Okay. Then there's the literal principle. Okay, the literal principle. And I'm not going to go through it, but there is a very, we have a very real literal God. 
he's invisible, but he's very real and literal. He made everything, everything out of nothing, everything that we can touch, he made. He's very literal, and what he's made is very literal. And his word needs to be taken literally. Even symbolism, as we've just seen, has a literal meaning. The parables that Jesus taught have literal meanings. We need to understand this. Okay, we need to understand these principles of biblical interpretation. So I'm not going to go through the other ones, um, context principle and the cultural principle and, and other ones like that. I haven't got time. So we need to go ahead and we're going to look at the who and when of Bible prophecy. So who are the prophetic messages written to? That's question one. Who? And then when will these prophetic messages be fulfilled? So those two things are very important when we're looking at prophecy, the who and when. The Bible is written in a very literal way, dealing with literal people, places and events. That's very clear, the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible reveals to us a very clear chronological story of God's plan and purpose for the ages. Very literal plan. God's eternal plan and purpose. So what I want to look at now, because we can't cover that stuff there, I wanted to go through an overview of that, but we haven't got time. But let's look at another thing here. There are three main classes of people that God is working with, namely Israel, the Gentiles, and the church. So if you look up 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, and it says, give no offence either to Jews or to Greeks, Gentiles, or to the church of God. In this one verse, Paul gives us a very clear division of three people groups. That as we study the big picture of the Bible, we see these three people groups mentioned or referred to thousands of times over. Paul only mentions these three people groups because there's not four okay so there's the jews the nation of israel mentioned in the bible so any prophecy or anything in the bible will be talking about the jews or to the jews there's the church christians and there's the gentiles the nations they're the three people groups and that we we need to understand this is uh, uh, to understand biblical prophecy properly Understanding these three people groups will help us to correctly interpret prophetic messages recorded in his word. This will also help us to discover the who in Bible prophecy. Who is it referring to? You can't apply something that is said to Israel to the church. That is mishandling the word of God and it's done so often. See, we've got to apply what is to Israel to Israel, the Jews. It is literal. God is saying things literally. It is important to note that most of the Old Testament prophecies are centred on Israel and in a secondary sense to some other nations which are associated with Israel like Egypt or Assyria. But the whole Old Testament is basically the Jews. It's basically Israel and the prophecies related there. The church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. We need to understand this. It's just not mentioned. It didn't exist until Acts chapter 2. Indirectly, the church is mentioned in the Old Testament by the salvation of the Gentiles, indirectly. But remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 to 9, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, and we'll, we'll have a look at these verses a little bit later, that the church was a mystery and it was hidden from the Old Testament saints. That's what those verses says. The church was a mystery to the Old Testament prophet. They longed to look into it. I couldn't. They didn't understand it. The church was a mystery and it was hidden. We need to understand that. So Israel is a key to understanding, understanding Bible prophecy. Basically, Israel started with Abraham, remember? And Abraham, he, he, God called him to go and, he be, and, he, and God promised to make him a great nation. And... Um, and to give him a land that we, he'd have forever. All the promises were given to Israel. The, the, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the law were all given to Israel. Okay? It's very clear. I haven't got time to, to, to go into all that. 
Jesus was born a Jew. The disciples were all Jews who also became the apostles. And the first eight years of the early church was a Jewish church. Did you know that? The first eight years of the church. It was just a Jewish church. That's, the, the church started off as a Jewish church. This means that, the, that gen, from Genesis chapter 12 and right through to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, the prime people group that God was working through to fulfill his purposes were the Jews. We need to understand that as we look at Bible prophecy. To properly understand what has been said in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, which is technically part of the Old Testament, the Gospels, as well as a good portion of the book of Acts, we will need to interpret them in the light and the context of the Jew. The book of Acts is a transitional book showing the changing from Judaism to Christianity. There's a, there's a mixture there in the book of Acts. And then you have the epistles, which is the church doctrine, the doctrine for the church, the teaching for the church. So have I got any more? To, have I got another five minutes? Yep. Okay. In the Bible, God refers to his people as saints, whether it was Old Testament, in the Old Testament, whether it was in the Gospels, the book of Acts, the epistles, or the book of Revelation. He refers to his people as saints. There are different saints spoken of throughout the Bible, depending on when they lived, what time period they lived in. See the when of Bible prophecy. The Bible mentions different time periods, which it refers to as ages, or uh, an age or ages. Okay, there's past ages, there's present ages, and there's future ages referred to in the Bible. Um, Uh, different saints, yep, different time periods. Okay, past and present ages. So we can see there. And there's the verses. And it'd be nice to look at some of those verses. Um, we might just look at, um, uh, look at one. Uh, Ephesians, there's past ages. Colossians 1.26. So Colossians 1.26. Past ages. And Colossians 1.26 says this. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the, part, from the past ages and generations, the Old Testament, okay? But has now been manifested to his saints. So the Bible talks about past ages, okay? And it mentions present ages in Ephesians 1.20 and then also future ages, it mentions. And these show us that there's at least three ages that is referred to in the Bible, <laughs> at least three different time periods where God is dealing with, with people. Okay, so let's look at the when of Bible prophecy. We need, to look at, we need to look at the when. We haven't got much time. So, because the Bible also talk, the Bible talks about different events that are going to take place on this earth. There are different events that the Bible speaks of that are yet to happen. And it must by necessity fit into God's predestined plan and purpose that he has. An event that all Christians agree on is the second coming of Christ. Is that correct? We all agree that Jesus is coming back. That's an event. That's gonna, that has to take place sometime in the future. It's an actual event that's going to happen. We know that he came in his first coming. That was an event. And he's coming a second time. That's an event. But we need to try and understand all the events that the Bible talks about, okay? All the events. The question that we need to answer is what events bring in the close of the present church age? So what finishes this church age that we're living in? Is there any, an event that closes it? When does the Antichrist appear that the Bible talks about? What about this tribulation time that Jesus talks about, the worst time that's ever going to be on earth, okay? In uh, Matthew chapter... 24 and verse 21. Let me just read that verse to you. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. This is what Jesus said. This is the words of Jesus. We're going to look at this in a bit more detail in, in, in our session coming up. For there will be a great tribulation. That's what Jesus says. That's what he told his disciples before he left this planet. For there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world unto now, nor ever will. It's an event. <laughs> it's something that's going to happen. We need to find out what is it that's going to happen. What does the Bible tell us about this great tribulation? Okay, when does that take place? 
What about the reign of Christ here on this earth? Does Christ reign on this earth when he comes back? Is that true? Is that an event that's got to take place? And is there a time period for that? We are told that Jesus is coming back for his church mentioned by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. When will this event take place? Will it be at the same time when Jesus come back, comes back to the Mount of Olives? We're told in the Old Testament that Jesus comes back to the Mount of Olives. He actually touches down. He actually lands on the Mount of Olives. And there's actually geographical changes to that mountain. It splits in two. That's an event. <laughs> we need to understand when do these events happen? Is there some sort of timeline of events? So to answer all these questions, we will need to look at each individual event to see what the Bible has to say. And that's why I, I, I'm in the next four sessions, we're going to look at, does the Bible teach the rapture of the church, which is biblically referred to as the blessed hope? Does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach a literal tribulation time and the rise of the Antichrist? We need to look at that. Does the Bible teach that Christ is coming back to the Mount of Olives, to this earth, at which time Israel accepts Jesus Christ as their Messiah? Does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach that the Lord Jesus Christ reigns on this present earth for a literal period of 1,000 years? Does the Bible teach that? And that's what we're going to cover in our next four sessions. So tonight, I'll be looking at the first one. Does the Bible teach the rapture of the church? Thank you very much for listening.